When you go into a dogfight with a teammate, you need to coordinate if you want to win. To guarantee that victory, each of you needs to do your part. So what exactly does each pilot need to do, and how do you get started in ACM? We'll answer both those questions in this video. The U.S. Air Force describes ACM as a substantial leap from BFM in terms of employment. No longer is it a single man concept where your only cross check is the bandit. This is because now you have a wingman to worry about in addition to the enemy fighter. You not only have to watch for the enemy's weapons, but you need to be careful to keep your wingman out of the line of fire. Since there's a limited volume of space behind the bandit where you can get a good weapon solution, there's also the added danger of both you and your wingman occupying that space at the same time. The last thing we want is a mid-air collision and a double victory for our bandit. This is why the Air Force also says task prioritization now becomes an issue because the fighters are attempting to either kill or survive while maintaining element deconfliction. Element deconfliction is just a fancy way of saying don't shoot or run into your wingman. If you've watched my series on formation flying, then you know that it is the wingman's job to deconflict. That's also true in ACM, but with one important caveat. Roles can be swapped, they are not fixed. In a two versus one fight, the bandit will have to choose which of the two he's going to fight. That fighter is known as the engaged fighter. Once we've established an engaged fighter, that automatically makes the other one the support fighter. These roles are important to establish because it is the support fighter that bears the responsibility of deconfliction. The engaged fighter has some responsibilities too. At the top of that list is to execute the best BFM to survive and kill the bandit. The engaged fighter will also want to get a positive ID on the bandit. Even in today's environment with IFF systems and advanced radars, it's not always possible to positively identify an aircraft as definitely hostile without getting eyes on it first. So it's not unheard of for a flight to enter into the ACM environment without clearance to fire until that hostile ID is established. That's why it's important to accomplish this positive ID first. The closest fighter will most likely be the engaged fighter, which is why this is an engaged fighter responsibility. Lastly, the engaged fighter should strive to maintain tally and visual if able. The last part is something to keep in mind since you might not always be able to keep an eye on your wingman while also watching the bandit. So do your best. Throughout all this, the bandit will be focused on the engaged fighter, which should help make the support fighter's second responsibility easier. After deconfliction, the second responsibility is to take shots of opportunity with a clear field of fire. As the support fighter, you always want to take advantage of the fact that the bandit is not focused on you. This lets you maneuver into position for a weapon solution, just like if the bandit was unaware of you. But there's a second part to that responsibility we need to remember. It's the part about a clear field of fire, which you'll sometimes see abbreviated as CFOF. This is a form of deconfliction because we're making sure we aren't putting the engaged fighter at risk with our shots. We can ensure we have a clear field of fire by creating a 10 degree cone of safety known as the weapon deconfliction zone. If you have a HUD with the pitch ladder, you can visualize it like this. Here we see a 5 degree marker above the horizon and another below the horizon creating a 10 degree circle for us. If the engaged fighter is inside this weapon deconfliction zone, then we won't shoot. But if you don't have a pitch ladder, then you can use the outer edge of the combiner glass of a gun sight as your deconfliction zone since that's usually at least 10 degrees in size. As long as the engaged fighter is outside of that, you should have a clear field of fire. Also, keep in mind the time of flight of your missiles. The engaged fighter should not be inside the weapon deconfliction zone at any point during the missile's flight, since its IR seeker could switch targets from the bandit onto the engaged fighter. The Air Force gives the following rule of thumb for time of flight. With the AIM-9P missiles that our training jets use, you can reasonably expect your shots to be between one half and one mile. So at most, it'll be six seconds. Here's what a six second shot looks like. You'll have to ensure the engaged fighter doesn't wander into the deconfliction zone throughout the missile's flight. Remember, you can estimate range using stadiometric ranging. Half a mile fits between these lines, and a full mile is this. Besides taking the shot of opportunity when it's presented, the support fighter has one last responsibility. 
watching the airspace around the fight for additional bandits coming to join the battle. With the engaged fighter focused on the bandit, the only member of the flight that can look around for additional enemies is the support fighter. Creating a contract for flight member responsibilities before the fight helps to eliminate confusion and lets each of you focus on winning. Without those established roles, the flight can present just as much of a danger to itself as the enemy. Now let's talk about how we figure out who takes each role. Sometimes it's not easy to tell which fighter is engaged, and the Air Force has a system to help with that. There's a hierarchy that lets us determine who should be engaged. It looks like this. At the top is the most defensive fighter, which means the fighter whose immediate priority is focused on survival instead of deconfliction. Most defensive has its own hierarchy. It starts with the fighter that has tally. If both have tally, then it's the one with the best angle on the bandit. If it's not clear who that is, then it becomes the first fighter to merge with the bandit. If for whatever reason it can't be determined who is engaged, then the flight lead becomes the engaged fighter. Let's look at some scenarios to see how all this works. Here we can see that Fighter 2 is approaching the bandit's rear quarter and a good position to employ weapons. However, Fighter 1 has the bandit practically inside his own rear quarter. He's vulnerable to an IR missile and possibly even a gun attack. His most immediate priority is survival, which makes him the most defensive fighter. That's the top of our hierarchy, so in this scenario, Fighter 1 is the engaged fighter. Now what about here, where both fighters are about to bring their noses onto the bandit? Neither fighter is defensive, and both of them will have a weapon solution soon. The next step down the hierarchy after most defensive is most offensive. One of the rules of most offensive is both fighters have tally, then the one with the best angle in the bandit is the engaged fighter. In this instance, Fighter 2 has the best aspect angle, and therefore will call engaged. In this last scenario, we see both fighters are approaching a high aspect merge with the bandit. Neither fighter is defensive, and they both share the same aspect angle. So who becomes engaged here? The very last part of our hierarchy defaults the engaged role to the flight lead. So here, Fighter 1, as the flight lead, would call engaged. And if the situation changes and ends up looking more like our earlier scenarios, then roles can be switched with the simple radio call. So let's talk about how the radio call works. When we enter an ACM engagement, we need a way to quickly and positively establish who is the engaged fighter. We do that with the radio call using the word engaged. So if the lead aircraft in the Eagle flight becomes engaged, then the call would sound like this, Eagle 1 engaged. But there's one more step that needs to happen before the roles are established. To be positive everyone is on the same page, a response is needed. And in this case, that response is the word press. So following our example, the wingman in Eagle flight would respond, Eagle 1 press. It's important to have this response so the engaged fighter knows that the wingman is going to take care of support fighter responsibilities. If there wasn't a response, it would be possible the wingman is totally unaware that a fight has even started. Then the engaged fighter would be fighting without support. So the response is critical. Press is not the only response for engaged. If you can't pick up the support role without going defensive or dying, then you should respond with unable and the reason. This could happen when you're the engaged fighter and the support fighter wants to swap roles, but you see that you would still be the more defensive fighter. In that case, you would say the following, Eagle 2, unable, defensive. There's one other response, and it's only available to the flight lead. It's the word negative, and it's used when the flight lead, based on inherent authority, is unwilling to allow the wingman to become the engaged fighter. Even though ACM allows some flexibility in assigning roles, in the end, the flight lead is still in charge of the flight and can overrule a request for swapping roles. Before we go into a scenario, we need to know two more types of communication. These are descriptive and directive. You can think of these as radio messages that help us increase situational awareness and put us into a better position to survive or engage the threat. So when one of you spots a threat aircraft, you would let the other pilot know with the descriptive communication like the following. Eagle 1, Bandit Right 3, 2 miles low. This starts with the flight member being addressed. Next is the thread ID. Then we have a sight of the aircraft that pilot should look at. This is a clock position, 
range and a high level or low to give a position in relation to the horizon. For this last part, you can add a number of degrees for better essay. So low 20 would mean to look down 20 degrees. You can expect a descriptive message like this early on to give every flight member a tally on the target. At some point, one pilot may need to tell the other fighter in the element to do something. This might be a warning to avoid an imminent attack or a turn to get the flight facing a threat. These are your directive communications, and there are three you need to know. A break directive would sound like this. Eagle 1, break right. This is a maximum performance, energy depleting turn with flares. When this is called, it means an enemy shot is imminent. So if this is ever directed at you, stop whatever you're doing and focus on survival. This next one is like a break directive. But instead of an energy depleting turn, we want a maximum power, sustained performance turn, and no flares are required. You would use this once a threat is spotted and the flight needs to turn to engage it. So it would sound like this, Eagle 2, hard right. When an ACM engagement is over, whether it's because all threats have been eliminated or they're running away, you'll need to recover the flight on the same heading. That's what the separate directive is for. As expected, it always includes a direction, so it'll sound like this, Eagle 2, separate 090. And in this case, you'll reform the flight on an eastbound heading. Now let's take a look at how all this comes together in an engagement. Here we have a flight with the call sign Eagle 11 flying in line abreast at the end of an intercept on a possibly hostile aircraft. Their AWACS controller has gotten them into visual range, but they haven't spotted the unknown aircraft yet. Then Lead notices their contact off to the right. He gets a directive out to his wingman to get into a more tactically advantageous position with the call of Eagle 2, hard right. To aid in situational awareness, Lead then adds a descriptive call. Eagle 2, bogey right 2, 2 miles level. This lets Eagle 2 know to look for a bogey, which is an unidentified aircraft. That bogey is on the right, at 2 o'clock, approximately 2 miles out, and at about the same altitude. At 2 miles, a fighter-sized aircraft is going to be a tiny speck, so this quick descriptive message will really help Eagle 2 with locating their bogey. Eagle 2 lets Lead know that the bogey was found with the call of Eagle 2 Tally. Now the bogey has reacted to Eagle 11 by turning towards the flight. Passenger planes don't typically maneuver on incoming fighters, so this is looking like it'll be a fight. Going down our hierarchy, we see that neither Lead or the wingman is on the defensive. Neither of them has an obvious offensive advantage at this point. So that defaults to Lead becoming the engaged fighter, which is announced with the following call. Eagle 1 engaged. The wingman then lets Lead know that he's taking on the support fighter role by responding with Eagle 1 press. Because of the earlier maneuvering of Eagle 2, Eagle 1 is now out front and the most obvious target. This leads to a merge where Eagle 1 gets a close look at the bogey and finds out that bogey is a hostile target. Lead lets his wingman know by saying Eagle 1 merged VID hostile. Now that the fighters know their target is hostile, they're allowed to fire on it. If Lead hesitated to start the engagement until after they'd gotten positive ID, then they would just now be starting to maneuver. But because Eagle 2 was directed to move before the ID and enter into a support role, we see they're already in place for a quick kill. Here's Eagle 2's point of view when the hostile ID was called. We see that hostile fighter already lined up for a weapon solution. The red circle is showing the weapon deconfliction zone. With Eagle 1 all the way over to the right and outside of that zone, Eagle 2 has a clear field of fire. Eagle 2 launches an AIM-9 and lets Lead know by calling Eagle 2, Fox 2. This takes out that hostile fighter, so Eagle 2 announces that kill with Eagle 2, Kill Bandit, Right Turn, 15,000. Here we can see that they're no longer referring to the hostile aircraft as a bogey, since they've already ID'd it as a hostile. Now it's a bandit and that bandit was in a right turn at 15,000 feet altitude at the time of the kill. In a training environment, it's important to point out the location of the kill by adding amplifying information. This is because in a fast-moving ACM environment, another aircraft may not be much more than a blurry speck. So that call lets everyone know who is the target. That's important because if the target turns out to be a friend, then the student needs to know about it. There's one last call that needs to be made to formally end an ACM engagement, and that's the directive call to separate. 
This is typically done by the support fighter since one of the support fighter's responsibilities is to clear the immediate area for approaching hostiles. That means the support fighter should have the best SA with regard to safe avenues of exit. That call would go like this. Eagle, separate 360. 360 would be the heading the flight would turn to. This heading should be less than 90 degrees off their current heading to minimize the amount of time they're banked. Whenever you're in a bank, you have the belly of the aircraft blocking your view of the surrounding area. So we want to minimize the time we're belly up. One thing I want to point out is that in this scenario, the support fighter ended up getting the kill. This is typical in ACM. The engaged fighter should be doing his best BFM and trying for the kill too. But because the bandit's attention is focused on him, it makes it much more likely that the support fighter will have a shot of opportunity. To really learn ACM, you need to practice it. So the focus of the next video will be doing everything we talked about just now in an actual exercise. All you'll need for this exercise is one friend to bring along, because the core of the exercise is communicating who is engaged and who is the support fighter. We'll walk through how to do everything in the scenario we just covered from within the cockpit. Then you'll be able to practice it for yourself. The important thing is to understand how to establish the engaged fighter and support fighter roles. After you can do that, we'll move on to dealing with multiple bandits and bandits approaching from the rear. I hope this was useful to you guys and thank you for watching.